All right, so we, uh, we, we are getting a really good quorum here. I think we're gonna dive in. Um, I am gonna go ahead and uh, throw the agenda and the minutes in the chat for everyone. Uh, and again, those who are just hopping on the call, unless you're one of our presenters, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, mute your, your mics on your phones and your computers. Um, uh, we're gonna be having a presentation today from, uh, from Leah Prescott, who is our co-chair, my co-chair on this um, infrastructure interest group um, from Georgetown University Law Library, uh, and uh, Zeph Delgadillo. Delgadillo? Yep, you got it right. Delgadillo? Right. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Uh, engineer with Google, uh, and they're going to be talking about fixity in the cloud, uh, which is uh, a topic that has come up um, both on this infrastructure interest group in the past quite a bit, um, but figured pretty heavily in the uh, cloud studies subgroup, which has uh, which operated on its own for about a year and a half and has uh, been moved over and um, merged in with the infrastructure interest group. And um, as we get into this here, have a, uh, some some things that we can unpack briefly about how we continue can, can continue this conversation that we're going to have here today, uh, maybe with some work over the course of the year that, that picks up from some of the work uh, of the cloud studies subgroup. Um, uh, we will be recording the presentation uh, here. Uh, uh, folks can feel free to, as uh, Leah and uh, Zeph are, are talking through their, their information, um, can feel free to throw some questions into the chat and uh, they'll be sure to circle around to those towards the end. Um, I am gonna be hopping off at about the 20, 30 minute mark um, and uh, Leah and I have uh, checked in with each other on that and Leah is ready to um, help facilitate the Q&A uh, towards the end of the call. Um, but uh, I guess the before we dive in, the um, one set of things that I wanna make sure we cover with everybody, just give folks some uh, administrative updates. Uh, this is coming from the uh, leadership team meeting that we had on February 13th. Uh, I wanna be sure to let everybody know that uh, we do have some new NDSA members um, as of this month. So the Rhode Island School of Design uh, and the University of Dayton have both uh, just recently joined uh, the NDSA. Um, so we may be seeing, if, uh, if we don't already have some of those folks on today's call, uh, we may be seeing uh, some of them on the infrastructure interest group calls in the future. Um, have a, a call out to anyone who is interested in joining the new NDSA communications outreach and publications uh, working group. Uh, folks will see in the uh, agenda, have a link to the interest form. Uh, if this is something you'd be interested in uh, participating in, uh, lending a hand in, uh, sort of a critical need that we've got uh, within NDSA for, uh, for getting information out to all of the members, um, can feel free to hit that interest uh, form and, and fill that out. Um, other than that, I think the, the only thing I'll touch on uh, just briefly now before we dive in, and um, Leah, maybe it's something that uh, uh, if there's time towards the end of the call, uh, and you want to circle back around to it uh, to gauge some uh, interest from folks. Um, we, we do have an admonition from the leadership team to consider how we want to, as, a, as an interest group, explore some of the uh, topics that uh, have surfaced through the national agenda, which is um, set to be officially published um, uh, within the next uh, week or so here. Uh, if not already, I haven't, I haven't seen any announcements come out, but uh, we should be uh, seeing a, uh, an official publication of the national agenda. Um, there's definitely a whole lot of things in there that are of interest to this uh, interest group. We've got topics lined up through uh, the, I think through April, May um, with some speakers, but uh, after that point, uh, the field is kind of wide open for topics. So um, if uh, there are things that are of interest to surface there, uh, would help to sort of reinforce some of the things that uh, that are that have, come, that have come to the forefront from the process of um, putting together the, the national agenda. So um, we can circle back around to that as we need to. Um, okay, so before we dive in, um, Leah, do you want to? I'm not sure who's driving uh, the presentation. Um, I will start, and then I'll I'll uh, switch it over to Zeph. Yeah. Okay. So great. So go ahead and get your slides all set up there. Um, so one thing before I forget, because Matt, you're usually pretty good at sort of keeping notes and I'm not going to be able to uh, for this, but if there's sure. somebody who is willing or multiple people willing to keep notes uh, as we go through the meeting today, that would be wonderful. One thing I can also, um, if, if, that's, uh, if that's problematic for anybody, um, I can commit to going back through it because I'm going to want to catch the tail end of this conversation anyway. 
um, I can commit to going back through the recording and, and capturing some notes. But yes, if there's anything that, that people want to uh, chip in here and, and uh, record, uh, in addition to what we're already sort of recording um, uh, with Zoom, feel free to, feel free to add to the notes. Um, so, um, Leah, I'm not going to uh, talk any further here. Uh, if you and, and Zeph uh, would like to say a little bit more about um, yourselves and your, your respective roles, um, you can feel free to do that uh, and then just go ahead and dive in. Um, I will say, though, um, that we, so basically, uh, uh, Leah and I had some really great conversations uh, as we uh, got things kicked off this year. Uh, particularly as uh, we were folding some uh, work and some topics over from the cloud study subgroup into the infrastructure interest group. Uh, we had some really great conversations, of course, about the work that Lee is doing uh, there at Georgetown with respect to this particular area and issue, the collaborations that you're having with Google. Um, we, for, for folks who don't know, uh, as I said, we, we gave this a lot of attention uh, during the, the cloud studies work and um, even made some efforts to uh, pull together a bit of a working group, the kernel of a working group, uh, be, right, right before we were sort of merging things over. Uh, that consisted of uh, folks like Bill Brandon from uh, Duraspace, uh, Krista Oldham from, from Clemson, um, Andrea Collis from the Paramount Archives, um, Dave Pocoller, uh, formerly from Deepin. Uh, had some really great people who were interested in uh, working on the side uh, within the NDSA to help build out some advocacy resources that institutions could make use of to uh, engage commercial uh, storage providers uh, like Google and others uh, to um, help help dial in the the mapping between their their services in the area of fixity and the needs that we have from our uh, particular sector. So just know that um, and and Leah, I think you'll you'll have an opportunity to sort of unpack this a little bit further with folks on the call towards the end um, if there's time. Uh, but just know that Lee and I are going to um, proactively uh, try to kickstart uh, that that working group to some degree and see if we can't actually get some work done over the course of this year to build out those advocacy resources. And I think um, the shape that that can take uh, will probably come into some really good focus over the course of what you're going to talk about here. So, uh, Leah, I'll turn it over to you and we can get started. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so, I'm Leah Prescott. I'm the Associate Director for Digital Initiatives and Special Collections here at Georgetown Law. And uh, Zef, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zef Delgadillo. I work in our professional services group at Google Cloud, um, helping uh, higher education institutions and other public sector customers uh, adopt Google Cloud and use it to solve some of their, their business problems. Great, thanks. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to talk about sort of the context of this project uh, and what we were, how uh, we led up to this here at Georgetown Law, and then I'm going to let Zeph take the heavy lifting and talk about uh, the technology of, of what he's put together and that we're trying to get in place here. Um, so when I first came to Georgetown Law, uh, there wasn't production digitization yet, uh, although there was a lot of uh, miscellaneous scanned files and things in different places. Uh, we didn't have any uh, server storage. Uh, there were no digital preservation processes in place, uh, just some general network shares that everybody was using and ex assorted external drives, uh, as well as CDs and DVDs. Uh, so even though uh, part of my title is head of special collections, the main role that I came here for was to set up a production mass digitization process primarily for the purposes of scanning materials for controlled digital lending, which if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, a model uh, by which libraries can digitize materials in their collection and make them available for lending. And it's based on interpretations of copyright laws of, fa of fair use and copyright exhaustion. So uh, it's basically taking your collection, including in copyright works, uh, digitizing and making them available uh, through loan using digital rights management to make sure that you're only loaning uh, the same number of copies that you actually purchased. So uh, we, we believe that that constitutes fair use um, and we're just waiting for there to be some uh, way for that to 
be acknowledged as being true, either through a lawsuit or um, just just practice that doesn't get challenged. So anyway, we're doing a lot of digitization of uh, our general collection of materials. Uh, and we're using two tabletop scribes from the Internet Archive, a Cabus One book scanner, a Zoichel overhead scanner for all of this, the bound materials. Uh, but we're also um, scanning uh, records and briefs from the Second Circuit Federal Appeals Court and the DC Federal Appeals Court uh, and making them freely available online because they are not anywhere else. You have to, you know, be part of LexisNexis or whatever to, to get access to these materials. So we're, we're scanning them off of microfilm and microfiche to put them online. And so there's a lot of files that we're generating as a result of that process. And we've also undertaken several uh, Pro, uh, projects to scan fairly large collections of modern newspapers where we can use a sheet bed scanner and uh, not damage the materials. And uh, so again, many, 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 many files as a result of those projects. And we're doing this with a, an entire department of people, including 75 hours of student labor a week. So uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of resources going into the process, which again is generating a lot of files. So uh, we obviously needed to put some sort of digital preservation process in place. And until the last year or so, the university operated its own data center and we had two shares, a 12 terabyte working space where files could be stored somewhat temporarily until a particular project was completed and then uh, final master files, uh, a, a share for master files that is was 30 terabytes. Uh, and then these shares were backed up by our university information systems engineers, but we only had the one place and the one backup. And the backups were retained for 30 days before they were overwritten. And in addition, we had about 22 terabytes of AV material on external hard drives that were just on the external drives. So I uh, had set up, I had mapped those two shares and used Fixity by uh, AVP to, um, to validate the checksums on a monthly basis before, so that I could restore a file with the original before the backup was overwritten by the corrupted file or whatever. Um, we generally don't keep intermediary files and our access files all go to their access repository. So they, they aren't include, they weren't included in, um, in this process. Um, we some had sometimes had local files uh, as well, but uh, we weren't following a strategic process with those. So, Master files for the control digital lending books were also stored at the Internet Archive because they're our partner in this. So that became a second copy in a different geographical region. Uh, but the but a lot of our files had no second copy. As is the case with a lot of universities, a couple of years ago there was a decision to phase out the data center and migrate to cloud storage and Georgetown University ultimately decided to move to Google Cloud Storage. Uh, our main campus library chose to use AP Trust for digital storage and preservation, but partially because of these fair use assertions for controlled digital lending uh, and the cost and the need to maintain uh, control over the files because of the legal nature of what we were doing, we didn't go that route. So um, we ultimately decided for the materials that were being sent up to the Internet Archive that that would continue to be one of our storage locations. Uh, the files go directly from our scribe scanner to, the, to San Francisco for processing. Uh, so that's one of the copies. And then we download a copy for local storage. In addition to the cloud storage, we're also implementing uh, using our FRED computer with all of its bays to write um, 
raw files to local bare drives. So uh, totally uh, bare bones process to have a, a local uh, copy as well. And those are stored in our special collections vault. Uh, so we still needed lots of cloud storage for everything that was not going to the Internet Archive. And we needed a way to check fixity and maintain an audit trail for those files. Uh, in the beginning, we had conversations with our university information systems engineers, and one of the main challenges was getting to a place where we could even talk the same language about digital preservation, and I know this is a common problem. Eventually, they put us in contact with Google engineers, including Zeph, and in talking with him, I began to understand that we were talking about a completely different animal with cloud storage structures. So I was not at all familiar with uh, object storage and how different it is from the traditional storage methods, file storage methods. Uh, and I had naively thought that um, I just needed to get the right access privileges in the cloud and that I'd then be able to run Fixity or Bagit or something like that. And uh, after attending some cloud summits and talking with Zeph, uh, I began to have a greater understanding that this wasn't just a matter of getting access within a proprietary environment, but that we had to start thinking about authentication in a very different way. Instead of running our own checks, we ultimately determined that we would need to find a way to retrieve the fixity information that was already being generated in order to maintain an audit log. Uh, and we wanted, we needed to do this without incurring the cost of retrieving files from cold line storage because as I'm sure most of you are aware, cloud storage um, has the different levels and in order for it to be cost effective for master files, which is what we primarily needed it for, which we didn't intend to um, use. We didn't intend to go back and forth and, and pull them down. And of course, that's where the, the cost benefit is in cold line storage is just putting it there and leaving it there unless you know you you absolutely need it for some reason so we didn't want to have to invoke a process where we were trying to perform a fix the operation on a file that then constituted a pull and cost money so with lots of conversations with Zeph and I shared uh, with him the Bagot uh, packaging format, which we are bagging all of our master files, and uh, the levels of preservation, the NDSA levels of preservation, and uh, we were able to start to talk about how uh, there might be a process in Google Cloud that would meet our fixity needs. Uh, so I'm going to let Zeph take it over, but before I do, and while I, uh, I'm trying to remember if I have to release. Um, do you have the Do you have the share button, Zeph, to grab the share? Uh, yeah, I should be able to hit the share button here. Give me just a second, and I can. Uh, I can. But while we're doing that, does anyone have any questions about sort of this general environment that we're talking about here? Um, and what I can do also is just give a, a little bit of a briefer on on Google Cloud Storage. Um, that might that might generate a couple questions too um, before we go into the um, the actual fixity fixity solution. I seem to have lost my main window here. And uh, hey, Leah and Zeph, uh, this is Matt. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna hop off. But what I'll do uh, I'm gonna I had a few questions. They may or may not be at all relevant. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, okay. Deprioritize those for sure for everybody else who might have questions. Um, but if uh, if you want to circle around to them and use them as fodder for discussion uh, towards the end, feel free. I uh, just want to make sure to get them in there. And I'm even happy to, if they don't, if you don't get a chance to touch on them, uh, maybe circle around to both you and Zeph after the call um, and, and, uh, and cover them with you then. Okay. But I'm going to do All that. Right. And I'm going to hop off. Um, okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Bye. So um, I'm going to start by just quickly introducing cloud storage. Um, Leah gave kind of a, a, a good briefer on, on how cloud storage works and how it's a little bit different from on-premise storage. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the advantages of using cloud storage. 
and, and why I think it's really great for these, um, these archival uh, use cases. So I'm going to use a few terms here. I just want to get um, everyone familiar with the terminology. So an object, when we use the term object, we mean just a piece of data. So this could be a, a file like a PDF, or it could be a JPEG image, or it could be a text file, or it could really be anything. But it's the sort of atomic unit of, of a file in our, our cloud storage file system. So this is pretty normal terminology. Uh, we have a bucket, which is just a container of objects that we identify with a bucket name. Um, we introduced as part of the fixity solution the concept of, of bags um, in addition to the bucket. So um, we're just trying to kind of merge the two different worlds of, of fixity compliance standards and GCS. So a bucket is distinct from a bag. Um, a bucket can have many bags. Uh, location where we choose to store the, uh, the file and storage class. So um, Lee was talking a little bit earlier around cold line versus near line. I'll go into that in just a minute here. Um, so what is cloud storage? It's just a way of, of storing files in the cloud. So it's similar to the way you might use uh, Dropbox or OneDrive or something else, um, where you have a, an, an API or interface to drop in files and keep them stored in a really reliable way. Um, so 11.9 is durability, so some, some pretty strong confidence that your file is safe in cloud. Um, with availability um, based on kind of how you choose, choose to uh, configure or, or what class you choose for your storage. Um, security, so encryption and transit encryption at rest. So as you upload your files and you store files, um, you have confidence that they're, they're safely encrypted. Um, some features, just some scalability, uh, redundancy. So as files are uploaded, you have that durability that's stored in many different locations. Um, so that you have uh, some clear confidence that you can access the file when you need to. So I'm going to kind of breeze through some of these slides because some of it's not super relevant to these use cases. Um, near line and cold line, so we have different pricing for different um, storage classes. Um, for more archival use cases, you're probably going to choose cold line because that, those files aren't going to be accessed very often. Um, so you get a lot uh, more cost-effective storage prices, but uh, you'll pay more on retrieval. So if you're pulling down a file very often, it, it's not a good use for cold line storage um, just because the cost can spike. Uh, Stored regional or multi-regional, so you can choose to store files in the United States where they'll be uh, sharded and, and, and stored in many different locations around the country or multi-regional. So you can say, um, I want my files to be distributed in a redundant way in the U.S. and Europe or U.S. and Asia or, or something else. Um, talked a little about this. Uh, some of these I'm sliding through. Cold line. So these are this is the really useful uh, storage class for archival use cases. Um, so you can access the file um, anytime you want to immediately. You just pay for a retrieval cost when you um, access the file. Um, you have very low uh, maintenance costs on it. So once you upload your set of files, and if you're not you're not uh, pulling them down very frequently then you're paying a, a very, very low price for keeping the files in the cloud. Uh, here's some, some of the pricing here um, before I go into the, uh, the demo itself. Um, we recently introduced um, an archival class, which is um, kind of even more cold than cold line. Cold line, um, it's a, a lower cost of storage, but um, the retrieval costs are just a little bit higher than, than cold line. Um, any questions about cloud storage and how it works? Before I kind of go into the problem that we addressed with, um, with, with Lee and Georgetown and kind of what the solution was. Um, all right. So when uh, we worked with Georgetown a few months ago, um, we immediately kind of uh, realize the challenge of, of using the existing fixity compliance process on Google Cloud. So some of the challenges, um, the way you access Google Cloud is not a normal POSIX file system. It's, it's accessed via API calls. So um, here's the UI version of it. Essentially, you upload files into this UI, and they're stored here in sort of what is looks like a normal file system, where you have this concept of folders and directories um, and, and files themselves with metadata. But it's stored uh, via a, a different kind of system altogether. These files are sharded out and stored in a whole bunch of different places around the world. So you can't access uh, using your typical Unix utilities. Uh, you have to sort of change the, the view of it altogether. 
Another one of the challenges is that if you were to run Fixity on each file um, in the traditional sense, you would have to download each file every time you ran Fixity, which in cold line or archival storage can incur some pretty heady costs pretty frequently. The good news is that Google Cloud Storage already, already maintains uh, Fixity, Fixity and, and compliance to a lot of these different protocols kind of under the hood. So on a regular basis, um, Google is running uh, these file hashes against these files and checking Fixity and repairing files on the go so that it's a smooth and seamless experience to the users themselves. Um, which means we don't have actually have access to the underlying audit logs. It's sort of a, um, you trust us based on these SLAs that we've defined. So this 99.9, .9, you know, this 11.9's durability is sort of the contract that you have with Google. Um, but we still need to maintain some of the auditability and tracking for fixity purposes. So we developed a solution based on the Bagot standard um, as, it, as it relates to the, the RFC. So I'm sure this is something that everyone here is very familiar with. Um, I'm in a GCS bucket right now and I've created a bag. Um, so this is just collection one, bag two. I have my data directory that contains my actual file archive data and I have a manifest.md5sum file that has all of the, the manifest information about the files within, the, um, within the, the bag and within the directory. Um, so this all should be pretty familiar so far. Um, what makes this solution interesting is that it runs these things on the fly. So if I were to create a new, a new file here, so say I was going to create file, um, file2.txt, so I'll do that right now. Uh, so here's my file. I'm just going to call it my file. It's going to be the, the content of it, and I'll save it here. Um, what I will do now is I'm just going to um, upload the file into this uh, into this this bag uh, and give it a few minutes here. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to trigger some fixity operations. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to replace the um, manifest.md5sum text file so that we have a, a newer version of it that contains all of the checksum information. So here's my file 2.txt with, the, with the, um, the checksum. What it also does is it keeps the manifest in a running database here in Google BigQuery. So BigQuery is our data warehouse uh, product, but it, it can be really operated as a general purpose database in a way to track these uh, file operations over time. So you can see here that my file upload date was here just, some, just about a minute ago, and now I have the record of the current manifest for this specific bag. So I just put here in a, a normal SQL query, and this can be abstracted out into some kind of dashboard or something like that too. Um, but this is my bag information, and now I have a new, uh, a new record. Uh, more interestingly, what this also does is it tracks file operations over time. So if we run Fixity on a normal schedule, we can we can track all of these different operations and, and see what changes or what additions have been made to a file. Um, so I have a ton of records here only because um, when we're running fixing on a schedule, there aren't many changes to files normally. So I'm just going to remove all of the, the uh, records where there was no operation. All right. Um, so as part of the records of file operations, all I have here are files that have been created. Um, since there have been no changes to any of these files, there have been no checksum changes. So the only thing here showing are new MD5 sums. If I were to delete a file or change the content of a file, that would generate a record here so that you have that auditability and traceability across these different files. Uh, so I'm going to do that really quickly to that file too that I just created. I'm just going to change it by removing the, the period here. Um, which would generate a new, a new checksum on the file. So I'll go back to my data directory and I'll upload file2.txt. Um, so it's an existing object, so I'll replace it and hit OK here. Um, so in a minute here, once, this, uh, once this, this triggers all of its operations, you'll see a new version of the manifest and a new record in the file operations that tracks the change of the, um, the MD5.
so here's my new file record and um, we'll be able to see it here in the file operations as well. Um, File2.txt, so here's our file created record and then a new version was uploaded here. So you have a, the track changes over the MD5 sum. What this does is it listens on triggers to new file changes. So as you change a file, it triggers it and runs all these operations. You can also run this on a schedule. Um, and what that does is just produces a, a log of all of the MD5 sums over time so that you can point back to the traceability and say that, look, none of these files have had any other MD5 sums change over time. Um, Google's also doing this under the hood, but the traceability isn't there. So this is a solution just to support that. Any questions so far on this um, on this demonstration or kind of how the operations work? Um, this is probably a good good point for pause. Yeah, this is Andrew Diamond at AP Trust. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, so this you created this solution for Georgetown Law. Is it right. generally available to other depositors? It is, yeah. We have it available via our um, professional services GitHub repository. So there's a few steps to set it all up, but essentially once you set it up, it functions like your normal, um, your normal bags using the Bagot specification. Um, so you just set it up based on a, a Google Cloud storage bucket and it looks for the presence of this data directory. So wherever it finds this data directory, it, it creates a bag. So I created data slash here. So now this bag is called collection one bag two. Okay, and do you support other algorithms besides MD5? It only supports MD5. So the only the only record that gets exposed to uh, users is the is the MD5 sum. Okay, and then last question. Um, you said you can configure it to run on a schedule. I assume that takes some compute time, and if you're running it like every day as opposed to every hundred days, um, it's going to cost you more money. Is that right? For the yeah, that's time? right. Um, okay. It uses Google Cloud functions, so it's sort of like um, um, what the industry calls a serverless. Um, so it only spins up the server resources that you need for the the brief moment in time. Um, right. So it's a pretty cost-effective solution overall. Um, it should be trivial compute costs, but um, it's something that you could basically uh, kind of plan for and account for as you're designing the solution. Right, right. And I can okay. say my experience so far has been it's very, very fast. Good to know. Uh, this is George Chablov. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Um, a question. Um, you uh, saw availability and I saw 99.9%. .9%. How are you um, measuring reliability? And in that example of 99.9, .9, what is it exactly that's happening one, one time out of every thousand? Yeah, so there's kind of a difference between availability and durability. So we'll talk about availability where it's that 99.95. Um, so that 99.95% number comes from the number of minutes that that Google is promising it will be available over the course of the year. So 99.95% if you, if you uh, multiply it by the number of minutes in a year means that your, your downtime should be expected to be like well, something like five or 10 minutes in, in the year. Um, and if Google does not meet that availability, so if, if, if your files are not accessible to you for more than that period of time, then Google will pay you back money as part of the, uh, the agreement. And that's different from durability. So durability is the expectation that even despite a downtime um, incident, your file would still remain safe. Um, and, and we can make that promise based on um, the redundancy that we, we sort pieces of your file all over the world in different data centers um, in an encrypted way so that we can always pull it back together if there was an incident at one specific data center. And I didn't see what were the numbers, typical numbers for durability, because I'd expect to see lots and lots and lots yeah. of nines. Here. It's 11 nines. So it's 99.9, .9, and that nine is nine times um, is, is the durability. Thank you. Um, I want to make a slight correction. So we do support one more type of hash. It's the CRC, CRC32C hash um, in addition to MD5.
Any plans to support SHA-1? Uh, nothing, nothing for SHA-1 for uh, GCS, no. Hi, this is Bill Brannon from Lyricist. I'm just curious about the, the number of um, data centers that uh, every content item would be stored in and uh, the frequency also at, at which you're, you're doing the kind of background um, auditing, checking, um, and if there's any way to see uh, information about what's happening there. Yeah, the background auditing checking. So what we can provide are some attestations of compliance for a few different, um, a few different compliance standards. Um, I think one of them is FINRA and there are a couple other ones that have gone through the, the certification process for GCS for the purposes of fixity checking. Um, I think that's as much as Google's going to offer is just the attestation of compliance. They probably did it with their, with their auditor um, in terms of how frequently they're, they're running these checks in the background. Uh, in terms of, how, of where data is stored around the world and how many different data centers, um, I think we have something like two dozen different regions. So a region encompasses like maybe a set of data centers. So one region could be Northern Virginia, another region could be Iowa. And within each of those regions, there's a set of, of zones of different physical locations where data might be stored. Um, but that all boils up to what we use in GCS for regions, which are kind of countries. So for the United States, uh, your data could be stored across any one of the two dozen data centers or two dozen regions, um, and then the different data centers therein. So it could be stored in any one of hundreds of different locations within the United States. I guess, do you make guarantees about the number of those? The that... only guarantee we make is in terms of the durability and availability of the object itself. So we try to abstract those details from the users and say that your data will be available 99.95% .95 of the time. Um, but in the event of some kind of disaster, um, you have 11 nines guarantee that your data will be safe. This is Deb Verhoff from NYU. Um, we saw in real time that the Fixity um, checksum was updated when you replaced the files and upon upload. Did you say already how frequently uh, this is running? I know I'm still stuck in a file, um, not oh, an yeah. object-based uh, modality, but if you could say a little bit more about that and about the options for us to be um, running this check more frequently if there is an option. Absolutely, yeah. So we, we have two ways of running Fixity. So the first way is on a trigger. So we have something that's always listening to the, to the bag into the bucket for new file updates. So every time it, it senses one, it will run the Fixity check across, across all of your bags. The other way is on a schedule. So you can set up a, a schedule to say, run Fixity on a, on a monthly basis so that you can maintain your auditability. But that, that schedule could be any in time, could be daily, monthly, weekly. Um, so we do have the mechanism as part of the solution to run it on a, on a schedule. And after running a scheduled fixity, let's say you ran it monthly, this big query center would be where one would check on their own health of their files or would there be reporting coming next? Yeah, that's right. Um, we, we haven't come up with a reporting solution. It's actually something um, that Lee and I were talking today. So we have this, this traceability here um, that you have a, a running record of all the different, the different updates. Um, reasonably, it would, be, it would be hard to reasonably expect a change in operations when it runs on a scheduled basis, unless the underlying fixity solution that Google's providing uh, didn't work right. So you can configure something where maybe you get like an email or something like that um, if there were a file operation that you didn't expect. So for the most part, you should expect an operation that's completely blank here um, in these file operations. It's only when a file has changed that you would actually see uh, an operation here. One of the things we were talking earlier about too is um, maybe creating some kind of dashboard, um, something in like more visually appealing way that that, that most normal users could, could interface with the solution. Because um, for right now, it's just, it's just a database. So you, you sort of need to have that, um, that capability to run these queries.
Hi, this is Mariah Caruso from the University of Washington. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, what does it look like when there is something that needs to be repaired, not updated? Um, yeah. And so, how is that exposed? Right. The, the, the goal with Google Cloud Storage is that that would never be exposed to a user. So when a file needs to be repaired, it gets automatically repaired under the hood. So um, I can share out the, um, here's the, here's the compliance assessment. Um, so as, as part of our attestation from our, our auditors, um, we have attested to validating fix some fixity checks on a regular basis and repairing those files um, as we need to, so that we can eliminate the need for these actual manual health check processes um, without, without notifying the customer of that. What the solution provides is that traceability to maintain fixity compliance for your own for your own auditors and for your own assessors. Thank you. Um, and then I had one other question, um, uh, just and maybe this is more of a question for for Leah, but for process, is are you bagging prior to moving into the cloud, and is there any um, validation exposed at that point, or is this strictly a in-cloud use of the bagging specification? I'm bagging ahead of time, and I think you kind of have to. And I know Zeph and I had talked in the past about what might be a useful process to check that, uh, check the bag as it gets moved in, but I have not implemented that at this point. I don't know, Zeph, if you remember us talking about that. Yeah, my, my recommendation would probably be to bag everything beforehand or at least have a plan for what files are going to go into which, which bags so that you can have everything in place before you run your first fixity check. Um, the way this works is that every time a file is uploaded, it runs fixity across your entire bag. So like if, you, if you're uploading files one by one, you'll, you'll just keep getting a lot of redundant fixity checks. So if you do it all in place for the first time or on your first one, then you're starting out a little more, a little more st stable and and uh, not as much noise in your your fixity um, operations. The other thing that I have thought about um, is using the manifest that's created that's put in the bag itself to then check that against the because it doesn't overwrite the bag its manifest it creates its own new manifest so. Uh, I would think it would be a fairly straightforward process to create a routine to check the two manifests to make sure that, and that that would check uh, the fixity um, and, and validate that the transfer happened appropriately. But I have not done that yet. That's, that makes more sense. Thank you. I, I was just wondering, so the, the, the example in the demo was maybe not something that was created, a bag that was created and then uploaded, um, just because it's looking for the rest of the manifest files and we wouldn't just have a data bag, it would have, you know, all the other. Yeah, um, I didn't, I, I, I didn't notice that in, in the demo, but I definitely have looked at our files and uh, know that I have, um, I have the, the regular bag it manifest and then I have a manifest that is has an additional sum in the title that that's the Google manifest. Yeah, MD5 sum. That's the Google manifest. So, yeah. But in my files, I actually have the regular Bagot manifest as well. Great. Thank you. So we did try to build the solution based upon um, the, uh, the ITF uh, specification. Um, so it, it should be fully compliant um, based on the requirements of like how you would structure a bag versus how you would structure a manifest file. Um, but if there's any feedback on, on how we can improve this, then we're definitely open to, to hearing about it. Okay, so any other questions? I have the, uh, we have in the chat the questions that Matt had asked, which I think you've already Zef, I think you've already covered uh, some of it, but um, what are the top level questions that a commercial provider like Google has for our sector when it comes to mapping your services to our use, uh, to our needs and use cases? What is Google's market research process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
part of part of what my role is is to help kind of connect the dots between all these services to industry solutions and and or to industry problems and help and help create solutions for them. So we we have a lot of um, in terms of, of compliance for file archive or file, arch file archival. Um, we've gone through a lot of compliance auditing, and what we find, especially with public sector customers, is that um, these compliance standards are really the big blockers to adopting these newer technologies for their solutions. Um, what we found here is that while we have the compliance um, for everything under the hood, the, the audit trail capability was just missing there. So we, we aim to kind of close that gap by providing some of that, that auditability and traceability. And part of what my role is to take these um, take these lessons from the field and bring them back to our, our product teams and our, our market research teams so we can help develop our solutions to make them more uh, directly capable to, to industry problems without building these custom solutions on top. On top. Um, so it's probably not a fully satisfactory answer, but um, we're trying to kind of take these lessons from wherever we can find them as part of our, our customer teams that, that, that I participate on. So um, in that vein, if there um if there were people in this community who would like to ask questions or give feedback, is there a, a place where they should go so that the information is getting to people like you who need to make the connections between the services? Yeah, I mean, you, you could always you could always send it out to me and always reach out to people on on, on my end. Um, if you're working with Google in, in, in any other capacity, um, pretty much any person's a, a good entry point into into reaching out. Um, another way you can do it is as part of the Google documentation. Um, on the top right corner, there's a way to provide feedback based on the documentation. Um, so if, if there's any part of the docs that aren't clearly answering the question as to how you can solve your problem, um, that team that's managing those doc documents is, is really responsive. Would you be okay with me posting your email address? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, feel free. Okay, so it's, it's a very easy one. <laughs> it is. Um, okay, so how does Google make transparent its fault tolerance and stress testing when it comes to its erasure coding slash redundancy schemes? If not at all, is that something that could be a helpful measure for boosting trust when per file fixity proves dis difficult? Yeah, the, the way we provide it is through our attestations of compliance um, via these, these standardized compliance protocols. So um, I think this attestation is for, let's see, um, SEC, FINRA, C CFTC. So um, that's that's kind of our main our main interface to to how we do this. Looks like this is all for kind of uh, that, finance um, industry. Is that publicly available? Uh, it is. Yeah, it's publicly available, and I can send out all of our compliance certifications. There's a there's a portal for them. Um, that would be great. And the other way we do it is through our through our SLAs and through our our, our contracts to our customers. So if if we are if we do not maintain the standard that we promise to our customers, then then we provide a, a uh, financial like disincentive to us um, so that, that, our, that we're held accountable for that. Okay, and I think we just talked about what are the appropriate channels or forums for this sector to engage commercial providers like Google going forward? Where do we meet on the ground and advance our needs in Google services? So I think that's what you just answered, but if you have other um, yeah, and, and I can always put you in touch with the right people based on um, based on where you are in the world and, and what type of um, what type of, of Google Cloud customer. Um, there's a kind of a, a mix between region and sector that we we support. Okay. And uh, Bill, this is, oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Frederick. I have a maybe this is not the appropriate place to ask the question, but I'll ask it and you can answer it or not as you see fit. How does Google's Technology with about for Pixity in the in the cloud compare with Amazon and Microsoft, and also what how does your cost compare to Amazon and Microsoft? Uh, cost I don't know for sure. There's probably some calculation we can do based on different use cases, um, but it's 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 really similar. Um, so if you look at Google Cloud Storage versus AWS um, S3 simple storage solution. Um, it's it's going to be pretty close. The difference is going to be around the way we um, the way we charge for those services. So I, I think um, with with AWS, their um, their archival solution is called Glacier Glacier, um, and the big difference in functionality between Glacier and Coldline is that Glacier has a wait time. So if you 
want to download one of your files, yeah. you have to wait like three or four hours or something. And uh, cold line is immediate. Um, but I, I think that ABIS might now have, now have like an immediate Glacier option. Um, but essentially, they're pretty similar. You'll find the same attestations of compliance between the three different cloud providers. Um, AWS might have a fixed use solution out there. I haven't looked, but um, they, they might have something similar to what we have in, in GitHub here, um, or, they, or they might not. But essentially, the underlying infrastructure is pretty similar. I'm, I'm curious Thanks. if anybody out there has had any conversations or experience with Amazon uh, to do the same kind of thing, to create an audit trail, of basically. So no one's aware. I, I'm not aware. Um, um, yeah, we, we did have conversations with them a couple of years ago at the Library of Congress and then on uh, another NDSA call like a year ago or less than a year ago. And um, they're just, they haven't been in the position to provide this sort of thing that Google is providing here. Yeah, That's I- That's the I short was, answer. Yeah. I. Uh, I'm, of course, here in D.C., and I've attended two of the uh, AWS archival summits of the smaller summits, and the question always comes up, and they basically always say, we hear you, but I have not seen anything uh, to address it, so I'd be yeah. very interested to hear if anybody has. Um, no, they haven't addressed it, and that's why AP Trust running, um, we're running on AWS storage and we do our own fixity checks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know that, I'm uh, sorry, but just to jump in there, I know that Amazon has provided some tooling a little bit similar to this, but it doesn't allow for the exposing of any of the, the fixity calculations that are happening within Amazon. It's simply just pulling the content out and re rechecking. So it's the same kind of thing that yeah. maybe Trust or DuraCloud um, already does. I wanted to mention in case anybody missed it that um, uh, Christian uh, um, posted the URL to the GitHub uh, for for this process if anybody's interested in taking a look at it. Yeah, we, we try to make the process to set it up pretty straightforward. Um, to some extent, it's still, it still is a, a fairly technical process, um, but there's a, there's a decent tutorial out there. So basically I just kind of walk through it really quick. Um, what you can do is, is click through the tutorial once you have a Google Cloud account and it'll walk you through all the steps that you need to do to get it set up. And it's a one-time one -time thing. Once you get it set up once, um, it'll, it'll work in perpetuity. There, there are steps that are once per bucket, but uh, they're, they're very simple. And, and Zeph has laid it out pretty well, so. Even though it's taking a while, but <laughs> yeah, it's taking a little while. It, it uses like it creates this little like mini computer, so you can just click through and then yeah. and do it. So that's that's the reason it's taking some time. But essentially, you just click that. Um, it's like a start here button, and it'll it'll run through it. Yeah. It's behaviors of Googlers only. They um like to expose um issues just to just to Googlers first, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it really hard for demos. I'm gonna create special accounts so I don't see this like. Google only messages. Um, any other questions? Anywhere I can help out with, and I'll, I'll make sure my contact info is out here so you can all reach out to me if you, if you have anything else. One other thing to, to verify, uh, you mentioned that the, there's a cost for actually running the compute for running the compute, uh, running the checksums. Is there any additional cost in terms of like storage or retrieval or anything like that that goes along with this? Yeah, there's storage and retrieval costs for the files. Um, as part of running the file, running Fixity itself or running the metadata check, um, you're not actually retrieving the file, so you save a lot on storage costs there, but there are what are called file operations costs um, that are charged like in the on the order of like millions of files. So you'll you'll pay um, a, a couple cents um, to get the metadata um, for every like hundred thousand records or something. Um, so it's still it's still pretty low. We did some cost modeling for uh, for Leah for Georgetown, and we didn't come up with much. I think it was over order of hundreds of dollars a month for the storage is primarily where it was getting generated. Yeah, a couple hundred dollars a month for, and I can't remember how many. Uh, how I, we we did a sort of um, 
we came up with just an abstract number of files and size and but it was pretty close to what we already had uh, from what I could tell and uh, it wasn't expensive it was it was certainly in the same range that we were paying our data center so it wasn't hugely different from what we were used to paying so and that so that included storage as well as the fixed D right. activity. Yeah. I'm, I'm mostly curious about because I mean clearly it's going to cost you for storage. I'm mostly curious about the yeah. fixed D. Yeah, yeah, addition. yeah. It's the file operations cost are the only thing really. Um, and you, you can look at others. Just basically cost to list out the files and cost to pull the metadata. Okay. Um, but it's 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 very low. Thanks. Yeah, it was um, it was interesting to see how that costing was figured out. That was. Uh, it, it's it's complicated, and I'm I'm hoping that that that's going to become a little uh, more streamlined. As a common piece of feedback, yeah, it's a it's very complicated costing structure. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, we're about one minute till time. If anybody has any other questions, I think. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in this, and so I think it would be useful, as Matt mentioned at the beginning of the call, to think about how we might want to continue this conversation, whether it's uh, a smaller group or uh, some more dedicated um, meetings throughout the year. So love to get any feedback that anybody has on how they'd like to continue this general conversation of authentication in the cloud. Okay, any other questions, points of, of, of order, topics, anything before we sign off? Uh, the recording for this will be available? Yeah, as soon as, uh, as, soon as it finishes rendering, which takes right, a, yeah, yeah. It might be another day or two, but then uh, I'll, I'll do the trimming of all of the stuff on the beginning and end and put it up on YouTube. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you all very much for having me. Um, really Thanks. Appreciate Thanks your time. very, very much, Steph. That was great. Appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, all. Bye.